I think we think differently fundamentally than the Chinese Communist Party members think. And we don't adequately take into account the way that they might approach the problem. We don't know because the Chinese have refused to talk to us about it, under what condition they would use nuclear weapons. And the other thing that, that we don't know and I don't think we appreciate is, uh, does the Chinese Communist Party really care about the people of Taiwan? This is The Global Gambit. Welcome back, everyone. It's your boy, and we're discussing Taiwan. As the war in Ukraine continues, countless conversations and concerns are flying around about whether or not this will motivate the Chinese, the Chinese Communist Party, President Xi, to undertake similar goals with Taiwan. Obviously, the operation would be very different, but just how different? What kind of operation are we talking about? Who would come out as victor? Would the United States and China really go to war over Taiwan? Later on in the conversation, we actually played some more games, some more simulations, to get a sense of what an operation by the Chinese could actually look like, and how, if at all, the Taiwanese and the US, and allies such as Japan, could actually mount a defense. Now, this is part two of a broader conversation I had with Robert S. Spaulding III, retired United States Air Force Brigadier General, who's now a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, where he focuses on US-China relations exactly, and the Asian Pacific military balance. And he had a very different perspective to some others about whether or not the United States would come out victorious against the Chinese. General Spaulding told me why he doesn't think any potential invasion wouldn't be maritime, but actually aerial, and why that would make it much more difficult for the United States and Taiwan to land an effective defense. When I did my master's in strategic studies from SAIS, one of the things that I was most fascinated by was the relationship of the military to the political. And, you know, the sometimes disconnect as you've said, a bit of a cavalier attitude that policymakers, be it in Whitehall in London uh, or the Congress in the Hill in DC, or wherever it is, can have towards uh, military doctrine. What is your opinion when it comes to the US, particularly political military relationship now versus, say, 20 years ago with the nation state building, uh, liberal interventionist uh, sort of approach that we had? You know, how do you see that? being applied or how do you see that different vis-a-vis -vis ukraine versus taiwan well i mean so the, the european theater has always been vastly different than asia one of the one of the um, important components of the asian theater is water uh, and the prevalence of water so you have ukraine is on you know borders a lot of countries and you know that's all um you know <laughs> The Russians have have marched west, and the and the Germans have marched east. So, um, and there's no you know large body of water that you have to get across, which tend to be logistically uh, pretty hard to contend with. So, number one, you have contiguous borders, uh, land based borders uh, in Europe that you don't have in Asia, and so as a result, the the Asian countries of Asia have tended to be even like um, you know the organizations that were prevalent during say the 70s and you know ASEAN today they tend to be very loose knit coalitions of countries not necessarily uh, strongly allied like the EU or NATO or you know the organizations that are, uh, you're in Europe so um, you're going to see uh, a little bit of different kind of coalition uh, in Asia than you're going to see in Europe. And you're probably not going to see as um, tight a um, coalition as you see in Europe. So I think that's one of the two of the biggest things. One is just a geography. And mm -hmm. two is that geography has then led to a certain you know level of relationships between the nations uh, of Europe and Asia that are just fundamentally different. And I think those are both things that are going to come into play when it comes to Taiwan. That's different, completely different than uh, with Ukraine. But do you think that the political element, you know, do you think members of Congress, do you think people who are, I don't know, let's, I'm going to just pick on the Republicans because, do you think that some incoming Republicans in, you know, a scenario in, you know, the next midterms, right, four or five years from now, do you think that they're going to have a sufficient understanding of what it really means to go toe to toe with the PLA in Taiwan um, or over Taiwan, utilizing effective aerial uh, engagement uh, and a potential amphibious landings. Now, I want to go into some scenarios with you specifically in a minute, but do you, do, just specifically on the political understanding of it, do you really think they understand it like those who, like yourself, have served and seen it? Firsthand? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think part of the problem is you need to understand um, you, you need to understand kind of the capacity uh, for combat that the that the Chinese have built up over the last three decades. You need to you actually need to 
get into the numbers. You need to know the numbers. And in, in order to get into the numbers, uh, you know, most of those numbers are classified uh, because the Intel community knows those numbers. And so, you know, it really requires you to understand the numbers and then make your assessment based on that. So how many in Congress um, are getting those briefings and are really, um, really um, equipped, I guess, to understand that? Um, I think you know, here you're talking about the executive branch versus the le- legislative branch. Mm-hmm. Um, ultimately, I think based on what I said with regard to the cavalier nature with which we t- treat nuclear weapons, I feel like this is what I feel like. I feel like we are going to ro- march right up to the precipice of nuclear war. We're going to we're going to step one foot off uh, into that precipice. And then we're going to realize um, what we're doing. And I think that is going to be the executive branch that deals with that. Some president is going to have to have the visceral reaction to realizing that if they go on this path, that they potentially lead humanity down the road to, to destruction. And so, I mean, I hear conversations in the Pentagon all the time where um you know, nuclear weapons are just, you know, it's it, it's kind of a throwaway term. And mm-hmm. I think we have to start looking at them in the way that we looked at them um, at the end of World War Two and in the Cold War. And then consider, you know, everything that we do um, in terms of those weapons, because, uh, you know, if we don't, then I feel like that's what we're going to do. We're going to write up, mark right, march right up to the precipice. We're going to take one foot off the cliff and then we're going to stop. And I think at that point, and I don't know what the um, what the confrontation uh, is. It may be over Taiwan. It may. Who knows? It may come earlier in Ukraine. But I feel like that's where we're headed now, um, you know, in, in, a, in a geopolitical sense. Very good. Um, well, not very good, but uh, that's a I, I, <laughs> yeah. Um, I need to work better at finding um, transitionatory words to use. But um, I appreciate that perspective. And 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 let's do some let's do some simulations. Well, I mean, let's talk about a couple for everybody listening in, um, be it on YouTube or Twitter Spaces. There was a a study done, a very in depth study done by the Center for Strategic and International Studies, or CSAS, and they brought out basically twenty four scenarios. Um, they called it the war game. I personally prefer simulation because uh, I'm not sure if I call warring a game, but you know, in every scenario, the US won, obviously with heavy casualties, uh, heavy losses, a significant you know ramifications for the global economy. But the United States did come out on top. Now, there's a couple of elements to this, and I just want to outline it before I, I, I pass it to you, uh, uh, General, for your thoughts. But you know, firstly, were we to see a um, an occupation or a campaign over Taiwan, damaging critical infrastructure will be fundamentally important, number one. Second, absolute, and I mean absolute, air superiority over the island and its ADIZ or aerial defense uh, zones, it's known. Now, we've seen throughout history the role that, you know, air superiority has. I think, you know, um, cases of... um, well, actually, the Falklands was an interesting example where there wasn't a need for that. But uh, Normandy, obviously, um, Incheon, uh, Okinawa, these are examples where air superiority was incredibly important for an amphibious landing, which is what Taiwan would be. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know if you're familiar, I'm sure you are, with Operation Causeway, right? This scenario that the US ran in 1944 about what it would take to be a successful <clears throat> amphibious landing. About 400,000 troops... Uh, 4,000 vehicles, double the size of the Normandy landings, effectively. And again, the role of air, air power in that. How significant is air power in the context of a potential engagement with, um, not just from the US side, but from the Chinese? How important is the air power for the Chinese PLA or People's Liberation Army to to launch an effective and not just take Taiwan, but keep it? Um, you know, what, what do you what, what have you read into that in your in, in your so so there's research? a couple of things that um, I want to go step back and kind of your um, opening to the question there. Um, one is you know the 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 premise that CSAS um, had a you know a series of war games and the U.S. was um, successful in each one. I mean, you go to you go to the Naval War College and they have it. Uh, the U.S. has won a war game in in the last decade. I think actually going back more than a decade. Um, in every war game I've been in. Uh, you know, we would have to go to extraordinary measures even to, um, you know, keep, keep create a stalemate. So uh, I, I, I view CSIS's um, outcome highly skeptically because you had people, experts in the room 
uh, that are experts at um, at warfare and had all the you know intel um, community information about the actual numbers that um, that the we believe that the People's Liberation Army has. So highly skeptical that that um, that that um, really is meaningful in any way. To uh, on the air power piece, I think one of the things that um, is particularly acute for uh, the Asia Pacific theater, or the, you know, as we call it now, the Indo Pacific theater is water. And uh, having flown over the Pacific Ocean uh, a number of times in the B2, there is a lot of water. And that means that uh, you have to contend with that water and generating sorties uh, in that kind of conditions, um, you know, is, is a problem. And so, you know, the, the, the Air Force doesn't have any bases in Taiwan. They have bases in in, in Japan, but all the bases that we have in the region are within missile shot of the Chinese. And so, and then the aircraft carriers too, you have to look at the DF-26s that, you know, were designed to take out the aircraft carriers and push them back um, from having sufficient uh, range to, to go after and support air dominance over Taiwan. So I think what, you know, in the war games, I've seen that, that, that there are periods where, um, Air superiority can be maintained over the island. It's not continuous. It's not twenty four seven, and um, and and also I think suffer from the fact that um, it's it's Americans that are that are that are the bad guys, not the actual people who would be doing it. Mm-hmm. And so I think a lot of the ways, and this is this I think this is true for no matter what you're talking about, whether you're talking about uh, uh, politics, policy, uh, military. I think we think differently fundamentally than the Chinese Communist Party members think. And we don't adequately take into account the way that they might approach the problem differently. And so, you know, whatever we running these air uh, war games, we're not getting a true representation of what we're going to see. So um, in terms of air power being sufficient to uh, stem the tide over Taiwan, I just uh, I think they have too much. Uh, weapons in the in in um, in missiles and rockets on their side of the strait that that would preclude us from really. I mean, the most that we can hope for is maybe to slow the onslaught for a little bit. We're not going to stop it. I mean, I agree with you on the uh, on the. It depends on the institute and I think tank or whatever that you utilize uh, for reference. But um, you know, again, let's think about I don't, to give you some numbers. So. The PLA, you know, using classic military, uh, you know, n- analysis, you need uh, a, 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 an invading or aggressive force needs, a, you know, three to one, right? To 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 a likely depends, of course, on a lot of parameters and context, but in, in theoretical terms, you know, three to one forces to the defense is, is usually what's needed. Now, the PLA would need, at this case, about one to two million troops to uh, invade uh, across most likely the west and south parts of Taiwan, right? But in their current form of equipment, which going back to 2020 data from what I remember uh, in preparation for the conversation, they only have, and this is only if they were uh, transferring troops, nothing else, not not equipment, not weaponry, nothing like that, just just troop numbers. They can only do so at 30K at a time, 30,000 troops. It's called, It's known as the Million Man Swim. That doesn't seem to me like a overwhelming, uh, overwhelming force that the Taiwanese wouldn't be able to stand, uh, you know, resist against. Then there's not to mention the fact that we've got a coalition of, you know, the third largest navy, the largest navy. The Brits are down there. The Koreans would likely get involved. Japan. Um, uh, I mean, not to mention all the other nations that are angered by the Chinese Nine Dash Line and claim of uh, basically the whole South China Sea. So, do you not feel that the Chinese would be going up against one hell of a resistant force, even if they do have a sizable stockpile of, of missiles and aerial projectiles? Or am I just talking out of my ass? So so let's um let's just for a second um let's let's pretend that nuclear weapons don't exist. They just they're gone because um that that gives you uh another complication. So let's take that factor off the table and let's just go conventional. Uh China has 70 miles to go. America and allies have you know, 6,000 or more miles to go to, and they have to supply the logistics to be able to answer that. So um, that is not an in- insignificant capability. And what the what the Chinese have been building, you know, is the ability to push off, uh, to, to push um, the United States uh, and allies and partners into a standoff position. And so we're, we're talking about out in the third island chain, even uh, positioning aircraft and other resources to be able to, so 
I mean, you're talking about moving uh, forces thousands of miles where the Chinese have to move 70. And so the weapons that they can bring to Brer, you know, in terms of missiles and rockets are just, you know, overwhelming. So if you just said, hey, what we are going to do over and, and, and here, here's there's two things here. One, we don't know. Um, we'll bring nuclear weapons right back into it for just a second. We don't know because the Chinese have refused to talk to us about it under what condition they would use nuclear weapons. We're, we're blind there. And the other thing that that we don't know and I don't think we appreciate is uh, does the Chinese Communist Party really care about the people of Taiwan? Um, I think when we um, when we think uh, about uh, warfare in the manner that you're describing, we are looking at it through um, the lens of the law of armed conflict. In other words, proportionality. You know, we're we're not gonna we're not gonna kill um, civilians uh, indiscriminately to achieve our objectives. Uh, we're gonna honor things like hospitals and churches. You know, these are things that um, the West does. Now, what the the Chinese Communist Party says in their doctrine is that those rules were made by the West to preserve the West power. In other words. They, those rule that set of rules advantages the West when we fight by them. So those rules don't apply to us because they were made by the West. They were made um, with this element of you know liberal democratic order in mind. And so they came up with all these guidelines, you know, um, starting kind of from Westphalia, and they've just kind of grown up over the years. These rules don't apply to us. They're not our rules. They're their rules. And so we're not going to fight uh, by them. Okay, so. Um, if the if you say that those rules don't apply and therefore the people of Taiwan are expendable because they very well could be expendable by the Chinese Communist Party and you have sufficient munitions, you know, you're you're what you're talking about is an invading force. Mm -hmm. What I'm talking about is an occupying force that has to go in there when everybody's been wiped out. So it's a completely different problem. I think because we don't fight war games this way. We don't say, OK, China, you can you can do what you um, what you want to take this territory. And um, and this is what the opposing force is. And and then see how that plays out. I think if you did, you would find that Xi Jinping really doesn't care about the Taiwanese people. He cares about Taiwan, the ground. And so if if if, if he has to kill everybody in Taiwan to get the ground because we're going to oppose it. And we're going to we're going to play by rules that we think that he's going to abide by in terms of law of armed conflict. Then it's just going it, to it's going to fall on the Taiwanese people, I think, um, to, to, to bear the brunt of that. And I think um, when you look at the weaponry that the Chinese have, you're talking about making Taiwan look like the surface of the moon. Kind of what you look what the hills above Normandy look like right prior to the invasion. I mean, you can still go above that that cliff face there and see the craters that were left by the bombs that were dropped, you know, in anticipation of that invasion. So, I mean, that's what I'm what I'm uh, thinking about when I say, you know, what is the chances that we can uh, that okay. we can defend Taiwan? Again, we haven't seen the Chinese military, let alone just the Air Force, right, in action since really the 1970s. So a couple of skirmishes with the Indians in, what, 2020 over a uh, border issue. Uh, I think a couple of casualties on the Indian side. But we haven't seen them in, in, in since, what, 1979, I think, 19 mid-70s. Um, that's a long time. Um, there's a lot of skepticism about China's um, maritime capacity. Yes, they overtook the United States in the amount of battleships, I think it is. But generally speaking, there isn't much real-time data on their <clears throat> capacity in the field, um, or at least going against a, a conventional, you know, balanced force, not a not a asymmetrical one, right? Then there's also the capacity for would they want to destroy Taiwan because of well semiconductors and the fact that you know they, I think it's TMSC if that's the acronym correctly, you know, eighty percent of TSMC of, of, that's the one are on are produced in Taiwan. Would they really want to risk that? Because, yes, that would put everybody behind, but particularly themselves as well. So would they be OK with undertaking, you know, total war, which for the audience means, you know, complete and utter scorched earth policy. There's nothing left behind. Um, or would they try to be a restrained and, and, and conduct limited warfare uh, in a way that you say the West does, but they don't care about? Um, I'm, I'm surprised you do say that because of these small factors which i do perhaps they're in your mind not as important but for me they they do come to mind so what do you say to that do you just it's it's irrelevant at this point they just want the island the unsinkable aircraft carrier to quote the u.s military no i i i'm so i think that um i don't know um but these are the questions that i have 
And I think there are questions that we have to consider that, quite frankly, we are, we're willing to just, I mean, any war game, uh, I can get to stop right away by, you know, putting just a few injects into that war game that cause the, the West to basically come to a halt. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens? Typically, those get pulled out just so we can actually uh, proceed on the war game. So, um, there are a number of things that the Chinese could do that would really, you know, hamstring us. No real time to go into it here. You know, I think that you have to consider that as, you know, as, a, 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 you know, one of the potential outcomes that could come from a successful resistance of an invasion of Taiwan. Now, you uh, and this a lot of people bring this up. The Chinese haven't fought since, you know, Vietnam. Well, you know, when we did the first Gulf War. If you go back to the first Gulf War, um, it had been a long time since we fought, and there was widespread speculation that tens of thousands of Americans were going to die in that war. Uh, if you go back and, and, and you and you um, and you look at the commentary from the experts leading up to the war, tens of thousands uh, of Americans are going to die, and. Um, and because this is what we anticipated, you know, kind of they had a, they had a classic Soviet military, and that that so that said, hey, we're going to have these kinds of of casualties, and it's going to be really bad, right? And what ended up happening? So when when you say that the Chinese haven't fought for a long time, there is precedence to say, you know, they have been equipping themselves, they have been training themselves, they have been she has been focused on combat capability above all else. For the Chinese military, you know, I think a, a good military strategist or a good military commander assumes the worst and then prepares for that. And I think if you assume the worst with regard to China, it, 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 the thing is over very, very quickly. So, I mean, these are the questions I have. I think they're legitimate questions. I think um, uh, if I was an Indo-Pacific commander, I would not want to fight China over Taiwan, period. If, and, and, just, and that's taking away nuclear weapons. Um, that that would be my assessment of you know the, their uh, relative capacity to both inflict casualties on America and its allies and the the Taiwanese if the um, if if the Chinese Communist Party seeks to do so. Just to your point about nuclear weapons, um, a bit of context for the audience uh, and viewers is that China runs a doctrine of minimum de deterrence, which basically means that they have the minimal amount that will deter what they consider to be you know. Uh, an, an adversary, a rival, an enemy. In recent years, particularly the last what, just year or so, we've seen quite a large array of satellite imagery suggesting, and there's a lot of uh, speculation on this point, um, that you know they're increasing their stockpile from 250 or so, I think, to you know because partially because they feel the need to for strategical defense or deterrence, but also for a symbolism in the sense of if they truly want to be in the same categorization as Russia and America, they need to have the same sort of quantity of nuclear weapons. So Russia has about 1,500 active nuclear warheads um, and another 1,000, 1,500, which are, could be readied quite easily. And then another 3,000, they think that sort of are just hanging around somewhere. So we're talking a good, you know, 10, 12 times, 20 times sort of the uh, the current stockpile of China. Again, a lot of this is speculation because as General has pointed out, we don't really know. But um, then there's the other element to this, which is that let's, you mentioned the term occupation. So let's say that, you know, you're correct and, and the Chinese conduct an effective amphibious landing, although they only have two months where they could do that, October or April, based on weather patterns. Um, but then they're on Taiwan. This isn't a flat, um, spacious place like eastern <coughs> Ukraine. It is a mountainous, rugged, the weather is frankly, worse than Britain's, I mean, it's raining all the time, great for a invading force, because then it quickly turns to guerrilla warfare, wouldn't you? We should just accept it. And, no, and, and I don't on. think that I don't think the invasion that? is going to be maritime at all. I think it's going to be an airborne invasion. I think it's going to be a combination of um, paratroopers and, uh, and, a, and a very, very large helicopter borne force that is going to be, that's going to follow a pretty heavy um, barrage of um of rockets and missiles um prior so i and i think the 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 you know unrestricted warfare kind of telegraphs the fact here uh when they talk about the tank tank battle uh in iraq um really the 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 champion of that tank battle being the helicopter and so i, I do think that the chinese communist party um, has learned that lesson i think you know this tank battle we're having in ukraine is really artificial if we had any kind of air power 
uh, a tank is is just a target and um, and and a, and, a, and a really um, nice fat juicy target to an airplane. So um, you know, I don't think I don't think it's going to be air, maritime at all. I think it's going to be airborne. Wait, so you think that so there's going to be a an effective, sizable enough set of paratroopers, aerial forces that are going to be able to hold back, uh, you know, a pretty well trained. Um, Taiwanese and very driven, like the Ukrainians are, uh, force. Because I, I, I think, they, that, yeah, I think that, gonna have that force is going to be. I think that, that force is going to be supported by indigenous fires from the mainland, right? So they're going to have the ability to place fires uh, from the mainland on the island in support of a, an invasion that's going to come from the air. That's what I think is going to happen. That's going to come after a softening um, of the, 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 of the, the Taiwanese using a combined barrage of missiles and rockets on the island. That's so, what so, I think is going to happen. So let me do some role playing then. So, or, or gaming then. So we, so, so that means that, but because they're launching strikes from the mainland, uh, what that, that, that inhibits the United States and others to directly target those uh, sites because they're on Chinese mainland and that risks the escalation to nuclear because we're striking Chinese mainland. Is that, is that the sort of the, the, uh, I, the think, I think that's that something that, you know, taking, taking the, um, taking, let's say, first let's take nuclear weapons out of it. I think the, um, uh, as I said, when you war game um, airplanes against uh, mobile ballistic missiles and rockets, um, the, it turns out that the mobile ballistic missiles and rockets are really hard to find, which means they're really hard to kill. And uh, we, we saw this during the Scud hunt in, um, in, in the Iraqi war. And, and this is just, it goes without saying that it's going to be very hard to find and kill uh, all the missile and rocket batteries that are in China. That's if we didn't have any uh, nuclear weapons. Now you bring in the added uh, problem of if you do strike uh, Chinese soil with an, you know, an American uh, aircraft, do you run the risk of escalating nuclear war? I think that's something you have to take into consideration. Do we actually think China's going to do it, though? Uh, and I'll premise yes. my point. <laughs> okay, moving 100%. on. Moving on. Um, <laughs> let me no, Let me premise my point why. Because um, what have we seen in the past couple of months, which is changing the psyche a little bit, right? Um, now, you may think it doesn't matter from a military standpoint, eh, they're irrelevant or there's too much emphasis. But I'm a demographer in my undergraduate, so I want to talk just demography for a second uh, and also mm -hmm. what's happening with COVID. So... In the past three months, we've seen the biggest challenge to President Xi's premiership since he took office, if you want to call it that, in 2012. The white paper um, uh, protests, as we uh, as they were sort of unofficially called, which we also spoke with uh, James um, James Palmer of Foreign Policy about at the time. You can find that in the podcast uh, on Apple or Spotify. But um, you know, this was a, a notable moment in in President Xi's sort of position, looking slightly, you know. Well, it's not that he's suddenly going to disappear, but it was the biggest challenge he's faced and sort of people talking about, you know, how much <clears throat> are conversations in the CCP, the standing committee, which is the highest level, beginning to maybe change. Uh, he's also been, you know, basically made leader for life um, and can do what he wants. But then there's also this element of um, do they want to really invade Taiwan? And I say this again because um, there is this notion that, you know, you utilize something like Taiwan to stimulate uh, nationalism. Right. The idea that we can always fall back on Taiwan as a way to um, rekindle belief in the CCP as the effective and only governing force for China. So do they actually want to ever utilize that to do the very thing that we've just discussed in, in different uh, ways? Right. Um, and then the other thing is demography. Last year was the first time that China's population has actually decreased by 857,000. Not much, perhaps in the context of China, but the point is that the demographic dividend, as it's known, was seen by demographers and other onlookers not to be reaching until the late 2020s, early 30s even, but it's happened now. And that's not posing well for China's economy. China's economy is slowing down. Yes, it's reopening, but generally it's not in the double figure of growth that we were used to. It's four to five percent. Some people have put it even less than that potentially next year. There's also estimations about whether China's economy is really as big as they claim it to be. Some a study done uh, looked at the size of lights and activity in economic areas and whether or not China's uh, economic sort of zones of activity to work as bright uh, and therefore intense in in terms of output as, say, the United States. Perhaps a bit of an arbitrary measure, but still quite an interesting um, 
prospect nonetheless. Do you not think that these things play into whether or not the Chinese really have the capacity to do it? And if not, then do you still, um, you know, do you not think it would be a huge risk to the Chinese economy? I think they've already anything? been moving. Yeah, I think that they've already been moving their economy to that direction, one of self-sufficiency. I think that's what the Belt and Road Initiative is about. I think in terms of demographics, um, you know, I'm not like the, like the, you know, as skeptical as say Peter Zahan is in terms of, you know, the, the coming China collapse because of demography. If you look along the Belt and Road Initiative, they have tens of thousands of, you know, of Chinese males that are intermarrying, uh, with the, um, with the, the indigenous populations, uh, along the Belt and Road Initiative, tens of thousands of them. And so, um, so I think the Chinese Communist Party has, a plan for um, dealing with its um, demographic uh, problem and its economic problem. And I think the Belt and Road Initiative is a, a huge component of that. Now, as far as Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping has said he's not going to leave Taiwan to the next generation. He said that. And one of the things that I've learned over my time studying the Chinese Communist Party is you got to listen to what they say because they'll tell you. Uh, and so uh, it's coming. Um, you know, I think, you know, putting uh, uh, Wang Huning in charge of uh, Taiwan reunification, I mean, notice he's not, you know, Taiwan relations, he's in charge of Taiwan reunification. I think, obviously, um, the goal here is to um, push Taiwan politically in the direction of um, it sees no alternative than to uh, capitulate to the Chinese Communist Party. And that's Wang who needs job to do, to basically pull all the levers of social um, uh, strife within Taiwan that would that would open up the political possibility for a KMT win um, and then and, and, and have the KMT uh, and the business con contingent in Taiwan really, um, you know, take the, the nation into a period where they're they're um, they're basically capitulating Taiwan now. Um, do I think that's going to happen? Absolutely not. I don't. I think there's a, enough um, people, uh, particularly young people in Taiwan, that 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 don't want to have anything to do uh, with China, uh, the Chinese Communist Party, uh, particularly after Hong Kong. So I don't think it's going to be successful. Which means then, you know, if she's not going to leave it to the next generation, we're we're going to have this period of can we can we basically con convince the KMT to basically give up the country um, or do we have to go to war? That's that. Those are the two, um, I think, things in in, um, in place. And I think the PLA's job is to get ready for that to happen at any time. Wow. Um, I've always wondered where on the spectrum I sort of sat with Peter Zaihan and, and other sort of political or geopolitical strategists. Um, I definitely don't think the Chinese uh, collapse is sort of coming, but uh, interesting. Um very interesting. All right. Well, I appreciate that, General. Um, so, so simply put, you think it's the century of the dragon still? Uh, it's it's China's century. No, I don't. <laughs> I actually, I actually think I think you know I'm very happy because I think uh, she's going to overreach just like Putin overreached. Um, ultimately, I don't know what it is about dictators um, and and totalitarian systems. It's maybe just the absence of credible um, dissent that you know encourages them to do things that that really. See, I think if we if we continue to look at China uh, in the way that we have viewed China over the last three decades, then it then it eventually results in you know a more authoritarian world. It just our world world's already heading that way as governments and corporate sector and financial sector all kind of you know um, work together to um, to create the kind of system where governments are um, uh, you know people are responding to their governments, not the other way around. And I think that's what China wants, and so. Um, I think that if China moves on Taiwan, and I think they will, uh, then I think the, the the free world will respond and recognize that, you know, the, the problem today, quite frankly, is that, you know, as we entered the first Cold, Cold War, we had somebody like Winston Churchill to come to America uh, in St. Louis and say, guys, we've got a problem. And we need to, and, and he had the credibility to really kind of uh, raised the level of awareness and and and, it, and eventually led to you know a long term Cold War. I I don't know that we have that person uh, in the in the West that can equal she in terms of intent um, to protect the the free world. And so I think we're 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 slowly um, being sucked in. And um, the only thing that will save us will be the realization that um, China really is an expansive power, not just. Um, economically, financially, politically, but also militarily, 
when they do take Taiwan. I mean, how many people said uh, Putin's not going to invade Ukraine? Like I was the one that said <laughs> he's absolutely going to invade Ukraine. Absolutely. Without a, without a doubt. No hesitation. Going to invade. You're in your element. I love it. It's uh, I appreciate your your passion there, General. But um, uh, my last question, um, you know, you've mentioned Cold War several times. Uh, we had Francis Fukuyama on in August, uh, and he doesn't agree with you. He doesn't believe that we're going to see a Cold War 2.0. He thinks that it's going to be a bit more nuanced than that, a bit more of a cold uh, sort of a, a multipolarity to it. Um, so I'd like you to unpack a little bit more when you talk about a Cold War, what that means if you mean it based on autocratic versus democratic values. But also, uh, you know, one of my favorite talking points I hear from people who are very anti-Western and just think the West is about to collapse because China's coming and uh, people who are very much, I think, overblow the other side, um, talk about the BRICS a lot. Uh, and this uh, notion of, you know, that China is leading this alternative economic model uh, and, the, and the United States economic hegemonic status is going to be upsurped. And I definitely don't think the U.S. is what it was, say, 15 years ago, pre-global uh, financial crisis. But, you know, are, are we really seeing uh, such a, you know, balance counterbalancing now, China and Russia really taking it to the U.S. in that economic sense? So firstly, Cold War, thoughts on unpacking that a little bit more and then the sort of financial, you know, new alternative system. Whether or not it's really yeah, hard. so I think <clears throat> I use the word Cold War because the alternative is World War Three Armageddon, right? So <laughs> cold means we're not, you know, directly militarily engaged with Russia and China uh, in, 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 in violence. And that is, I think, important. It, it, it's something that that <clears throat> we should almost embrace Cold War, because if we are in a Cold War, that means that we're not lo lobbing nuclear weapons at each other. So when I say cold, I think I don't I don't think it's a bad thing. I actually think it's a good thing because it, it means that, you know, cooler heads have prevailed. You know, the Russians, the Chinese and the Americans have all said, hey, we don't want to lob nuclear nuclear weapons at each other because we actually think it could be the end of humanity. So instead, we're going to have this ideological because let's be honest. The Chinese do not share the ideology of the of the liberal democratic order. They've said so. They want to change it. They want to have an order where, you know, governments respond, or the governments are, you know, rule over the people, not the people rule over their governments. And so, you know, that is the, 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 the ideological conflict that's happening. And anybody that says that that's not going on is just not being intellectually honest. It's, it's just not reading um, and, and listening to what the Chinese are saying and then listening to what the West is saying. You know, we believe in principles like rule of law, you know, uh, human rights, civil liberties. Um, self-determination. These are all things that are concepts that, you know, we have we have built the international order around. The Chinese Communist Party feels that those all, all concepts are actually weapons aimed at the destruction of the Chinese Communist Party. So we're in this very, very um, um, significant ideological struggle that, you know, in many ways uh, mirrors the, the first Cold War. The difference today is that globalization, the internet, really gives um, an authoritarian system that's brought into the liberal democratic order enormous purchase into the uh, influencing the political process and influencing the institutions of the West in ways that are counter to our own uh, principles and values. So as long as uh, the Chinese Communist Party is brought into the World Health Organization, World Trade Organization, United Nations, uh, World Bank, IMF, as long as they're part of all these institutions, their goal is to undermine the principles and values that uh, upon which those um, those institutions were founded. That is a dire threat to the free world. And if we don't recognize it as such, then, you know, we're just being into, again, intellectually dishonest. So I think um, Cold War is much better than a hot war. I think, um, you know, as opposed to Francis Fukuyama, we're not going to be in a Cold War. We are in a Cold War. The Cold War started. We're just <laughs> failing to acknowledge that it even exists. I'll uh, I'll be sure to um I'll be sure to let uh, the professor know uh, next time I I speed dial him. I'm what about though this this propensity for the Chinese model to be appealing? 
one of the biggest things, you know, there's a reason that the Japanese national security strategy, the American national security strategy are, you know, Russia wants to be relevant. That's why, you know, it's a reckless revanchist power. Revanchism meaning, you know, looking at things in a very extraterrestrial or ter- territorial sort of sense, right? It's from an anti uh, imperialist sort of perspective for the audience. Um, but it's, re- but it's, you know, it doesn't have the same capacity that China does. Uh, China is a real systemic risk. But then we've got other risks, transnational climate change. So is there not any area, I'm trying to find a positive theme here for a second, is there not any area that we could see um, collaboration overlapping with the Chinese on on transnational issues? Or is it, do you just don't think it's a case because of the uh, more regional specific self-interests that prevail over those collective, um, uh, you know, global ones, if that makes sense? Well, I mean, I, you know, <laughs> And this is this is it's it's really preposterous because who's building coal fired plants? You know, I mean, it's not America, <laughs> it's not Europe, <laughs> it's China. And so, I mean, it, you know, we we I, I just I got through saying that the Chinese Communist Party has basically all but said that the rules that were developed um, for the international order, including climate rules, were 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 built to preference you know um, you know the West, and so therefore you know. We're happy to play along with your um, concerns for the climate, but only insofar as you know we can um, deal with the 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 unequal terms that you know this this whole economic economic system was built upon, and and therefore we're going to continue to produce carbon to the rate that we need. And so, r- really, literally, can we do anything about the climate if China's not going to do anything? And if they're not going to do anything, what the hell do we think we're doing? I mean. You know, it's just let's let's bankrupt all of the West. Let's put you know, let's put let's let's basically get rid of all um, technology. Let's just put us back to, you know, the agrarian period. And um, and then, you know, will China stop what it's doing in order to save the planet? No, they're not going to. So, you know, all you're doing here and, and this is, by the way, this is why the everybody wants the China model, because you know what? The people in China actually have jobs. You know, they have a they feel like they have a future. The people in the West, we've seen in declining productivity year over year and declining amounts of you know, jobs like manufacturing jobs. You've seen that all go to China. So 600 million people are raised out of poverty in China, while the West is, is increasingly seeing the, the, the lack of economic opportunity for the working class. I think, of course, they're gonna, everybody's going to look to China. And, and that is the beauty of the system that we've allowed them to create. And We've allowed them to. They, they didn't do it without our help. And why did we help them? For greed, for simple greed, corporate and financial greed. And, you know, it, it, it works. And that's why they're able to influence our political system. They influence through our corporations, through our financial institutions. And so, you know, I don't, I don't know how to say it. You know, it's just I, I say it over and over. They, they, uh, they do very well. I, I actually admire them. I admire their strategy. I admire the, 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 the way that they're going after it. And I th- just think that we're naive in the uh, Charlie Brown comic. And the, and the favorite uh, meme right, okay. of the Charlie Brown comic is Lucy in the football. And <laughs> Lucy tells him every single time, I'm not going to move the ball when you kick it this time. And every single time she moves the ball. So in that, so Lucy is China. Mm-hmm. And Charlie Brown is is the West, and China keeps pulling the ball away from us, and we 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 just keep getting suckered right back in, and it's it's going on right now with Leo Hu at the at the, at the World Economic Forum, and we're the hedge funds pouring billions of dollars into Chinese stocks right now because oh you know zero COVID's over, you know China's back. Oh, give me a break. Um, are you are you quite passionate about this uh, this topic? <laughs> just like, um, like how many times do you, does something have to happen to you? Like your 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 sibling and keeps slapping you, slapping you, slapping. You. Well, this time, sure, he's not going to slap me. Well, I'm I'm enjoying this very much, General Robert Spalding. Thanks for watching this episode of the Global Gambit. If you enjoyed it, subscribe, give the video a like. It's the easiest and simplest way to really support this channel. If you missed part one of our conversation on Ukraine and the similarities, click here and check it out. Otherwise, see you in a future episode. Take care.